listening to the Fantasy Takeaway Podcast with Murphy Hamilton and Joe Pollock. Proud member of the Full-Time Fantasy Podcast Network. Subscribe, listen, take home the title. What's up, Takeaway Nation? Welcome into the Week 10 Preview episode. Jeff, Joe, I have a very interesting question to start the show off. We are now at the point in the season where playoff hopes are either coming alive or being crushed. The guys in the lead are taking their lead and running with it. You know, one loss teams. Then you've got guys in the middle of the pack vying for that fourth seed. With that being said, who is the most disappointing player in fantasy so far? Baker Mayfield. I don't have any of him, but like he was ranked as a top five quarterback for so many people. And he doesn't even feel like he's been as good as he has been. He's been a total disaster. Yeah, man, that's a really, really good one. And of course, now I I feel a little hard pressed because it's hard to say some guys are disappointing because injuries have really kind of messed with a lot of values. I look at like the Big Ben injury, messing with Juju, messing with Vance McDonald, messing with uh, James Conner. But um, man, yeah, I I think Todd Gurley's still a little disappointing. You could just piggyback with OBJ, too. Uh, well, it, that was the thing is I didn't want to piggyback. If I got to choose somebody who's kind of independent, there was this glimmer of hope at the end of the, the preseason when people were like, hey, Todd Gurley's going to be fine. He's running. He's this. He's that. And we're just not seeing him really unleashed. I'm hoping to see more of that in the back half of the season. But that Rams O-line is still abysmal. It looks That's like the, the Jeff, problem. Yes. Yeah, the Jeff Fisher O-line that the Rams had, you know, uh, three years ago. And we're we're seeing more of those same results. The other thing is, is that they haven't been able to make any adjustments with people putting six defensive linemen in every gap. Like they they haven't been able to beat it. I don't know if they will going down the stretch, but it's been ugly so far. Yeah. I mean, we had, where did we have Baker in our consensus preseason? We we had him at nine. Lower than the fantasy community consensus. We did. Nine feels like we did a good job compared to everybody else on Baker. Well, here's what we had. So I, I had to pull it up because that was such an interesting one you pulled. So we had him at nine consensus. Joe, you had him at, oh, oh, wait, everything just got shuffled. What happened here? Anyway, he was at eight, apparently consensus. I don't know what just happened, but he changed to eight literally while I was staring at the dock. Joe, you had him at seven. Murphy, six. I had him at 18. So you win. I mean, on the- uh, he's much lower than 18. <laughs> he's he's yeah. so bad right but now. But still, I mean, you did, compared to the rest of the fantasy community, you came in and said, whoa, pump the brakes. Oh, so good job, Joe. A little bit of luck. That's all that is. Guys, mine is going to be Le'Veon Bell. And there was a whole portion of the fantasy community at the preseason and the the drafts going, it's the Jets. Calm down. And I admit, I didn't heed them. I have some Le'Veon Bell shares and I'm really disappointed. And it's not his fault, really. It's the team around him. Darnold missing those games sucks. But for where people were still paying, you know, in ADP, it was kind of a bust so far. I think what we've learned here is that Adam Gase can ruin literally any player. That's sad. Yeah, he needs to stop getting NFL work immediately. And and because I had the document already pulled up, running back wise, Joe, you and I had Bell at six. Murphy, you had him at seven. So I mean, you're not you're not, you're not that far off. I mean, we were all right there. We had him six overall. <laughs> but I mean, you were the lowest on him out of the three of us. The crazy <laughs> part is the volume has actually been there. Yeah, it's just yeah, like been I said, it's so team so bad. Him. Well, he's finding out how the other half live now because that Steelers O line really made him look good for a lot of years. And now he doesn't have that group in front of him, just opening up these ginormous holes for him to run through. And uh, he's having to do a lot of that kind of dirty work on his own now. All right, guys. Well, we got a lot to get into on the show. So let's dive right in. Let's do some news. News and notes from across the NFL. All right. First up, the Washington Redskins have announced that Dwayne Haskins will start again this week. Apparently winning a World Series is enough winning for the city for a while. (laughs) I'm just crying for Terry McLaurin. It's so Me sad. Too. So sad. All right. Next up, Freddie Kitchens has hinted that Kareem Hunt's workload may cut into Nick Chubb's. While not a surprise, it is scary news for Chubb owners. We just finished Halloween. I had to throw something scary in there. It's not that scary. <laughs> it's not that scary. He's <laughs> if if he cuts into Chubb's workload, it's only going to be by a few touches. We talked about this a little bit on on uh, Monday night. He's going to get work, but he's going to take it from. The, you know, the other guys that are there, I think they're going to take the ball out of Baker's hand a little bit because he's been terrible. They're going to take a couple of touches from Chubb. And then I don't know why the other running back who's there, his name is escaping me now. Um, 
he's basically Hilliard. Hilliard. Yeah, he'll be relegated to the bench. Yeah. And so he'll get reasonable work, but don't be scared if you're a Chubb owner. He's going to be fine. I would be a little scared. We're not going to see what we saw out of Nick Chubb early in the season because he was getting 80 plus percent snap shares early in the season. That's dead. That's gone now unless Kareem Hunt gets hurt. You don't think we'll see him side by side in the backfield? I think we'll see a little bit. We're not going to see 85 percent out of either of these guys unless the other one gets hurt. And even then we might not. Well, that's fair. I I think that's a a reasonable thing to assume. But I mean, having two fresh stud running backs like that. Yeah, your own line's bad, but these guys can still beat some of those boxes. Like it's a good place for Baker to be in. Make those safeties cheat up and maybe God willing, you can get a good look in the back half to Odell going deep. But they have to do something because Baker looks terrible. Free Todd Munkin. (laughs) I saw that on Twitter. Is it trending yet? Yes. Well, not not really, but it was. I saw, I've seen it run enough. I think it might be slowly getting there. It needs to happen, man. This offense should be good. Like, the offensive line isn't that bad. Baker Mayfield has shown that he can be a capable quarterback. Their receiving weapons are ridiculously good. They're now going to have two elite running backs in their backfield. If this offense isn't a top 15 offense going forward, heads need to roll immediately. Yeah, and I don't know that they will, and and here's why. And this was part of what went into the Baker Mayfield kind of preseason analysis was that every time we see these kind of super teams get together, what happens? They always underperform, and there's always like this kind of gelling period they have to go through, and it typically takes about a season. And that's why, you know, I mean, I think a lot of us wanted to see Odell go bananas because he's so hard to cover. We wanted to see Jarvis get back to where he was in Miami. And, And then, of course, you have Chubb and now Hunt, it made sense on paper, but the game isn't played on paper and there's still some psychology that goes into the game. And these guys still have to mesh and gel and have that chemistry just as much as they have to be talented. All right, Joe, this next one's for you. Nick Foles returns next week after the Jags buy and they have announced that he will start Minshew Mania is over for now. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> It's a whole different tone this I time. I mean, I feel like Last it was a little time. sadder that time than any other time. Well, I, I turned the volume down a little bit just so we could, you know. You should have faded it out. Like you should have played it and had it just <laughs> Actually, fade out. I thought about building one that like I slowed down the tempo progressively <laughs> as it went through. So it's like, <laughs> I mean, here's the thing, man. We go from Minshew mania back to big uh, Nick. I mean, I hate that. <laughs> He's got a t-shirt, man. He sucks, though. He's not that good of a quarterback. He had like <laughs> one good not. run. He's like, he's almost Joe Flacco. He's had two good runs. He had that run in Philadelphia the first time where he went like 22 and four touchdown interception ratio. And then he had the second run where he stepped in for Wentz and won a Super Bowl. Both times like 18 Philly. and two, wasn't it? Uh, you know, I my numbers could be off, but I thought it was like 22 and four or some crazy. It could have been 18 and two. Whatever it was, stupid touchdown to interception ratio. Hardly anything that could be replicated, especially by a guy who, you know, no offense to Nick Foles, he's not that elite tier of talented quarterback. Wasn't that the Chip Kelly first year too? Yeah. Yeah. He was yeah. whipping it around the field to like, you know, Deshaun Jackson and Macklin. And, you know, I think Jordan Matthews was still there. And, well, he's back now. Yeah, he's back. <laughs> 27 <laughs> and two. So I had the two Oof. right. I mean, well, I mean, I was over 20, so I mean, I got that part right. So, I mean, between us, we were really close. I think really it's like, close. I think Let's it's like give a ourselves an A plus pat on the back. Let's, I mean, we can just high five that out. <laughs> we're feeling good about life. <laughs> Moving on. All Over right. Again. Some lighthearted news to end news and notes. Um, kind of some funny stuff. A sports betting company called Point Bet Sportsbook has announced that it will refund any bets made in the preseason on Mitch Trubisky to win the NFL MVP. I'm glad I didn't make any of those bets, but it would have been nice if I did on that site. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's very nice. I mean, a lot of the stories I saw about this pointed out, like they're not getting free advertising and they're kind of encouraging people to, you know, resubmit bets with the, that money in different areas. But I mean, Hey, it's pretty funny. I like that. I mean, as bad as Trubisky has been, this has been some, some funny news. I think it is. But I mean, what was, what were the odds on that? Like, I mean, what were you getting? If you put in a hundred dollar bet on Trubisky to win the MVP, like what were you getting paid? Like $14 million? No, oh, yeah, a lot. not that much. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> it was probably 80 to one at least. Yeah. I'm still keeping my money on that one. Yeah. You couldn't pay me to make that bet. Injury roundup. 
All right. This would be a quick one. It actually was shorter than normal. I can breathe a little easier. Uh, first up, players going to IR. Cam Newton is finally out on IR. Preston Williams, we talked about in the last show. And Deshaun Jackson also talked about in the last show. Uh, moving on to players that are out. Adam Thielen, T.Y. Hilton, Paris Campbell had a surgery on a broken hand. D.D. Westbrook and Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks, man. It's panic time on Brandon Cooks' career. This is a big deal. They're talking about, we don't know when he'll ever play again. He's going to see a concussion specialist. This is like, oh my gosh, Brandon Cooks. It sucks because he was like a top 10 dynasty wide receiver like less than a year ago. And now all of a sudden he's just gone. Yeah. I mean, right now the, the chief concern is about his health and making sure he's good to go for the long term. Another part of this whole guys that are out. It really kind of bothers me that in Indianapolis, we basically have Paris Hilton. <laughs> That's a Roto Bros joke. <laughs> is it really? Chris McConnell <laughs> accidentally said Paris Hilton totally seriously. <laughs> and they just like died laughing. They couldn't stop. It was funny. I just noticed because the way it was written here, I was like, that's really close to being Paris Hilton. That's a- <laughs> <laughs> you people don't get her. What do you mean? You people? don't give her more airtime. <laughs> I mean, you dad joke people. All right, let's move on to players that are trending in the wrong direction. We've got Chase Edmonds, Sterling Shepard, Evan Ingram, Le'Veon Bell, and Delaney Walker. Uh, quickly, I want to mention Le'Veon Bell. I've got an asterisk next to him. He more than likely will play Sunday from all the things I've seen so far. I could easily change, but if he does, they've mentioned that he's very sore. While the MRI he had didn't show anything really bad that would maybe hold him out long term, he may not be 100%. We've already talked about him earlier in the show. The offensive line is not good. I wouldn't roll him out. I'd go ahead and pretend he's out right now. Yeah, it depends on what you have. Like, I would probably throw him oh, yeah. out there over Kalen Balaj this week, even though Kalen Balaj is probably going to get a ton of work. But if you've got a viable alternative, certainly I would consider sitting Le'Veon Bell. Yeah, I'm looking at this and saying, you know, it seems kind of cryptic. Like, it's, I feel like they're not giving us a lot of information. Typically, we hear, oh, it's an MCL, it's a sprain, it's this, it's that. But I feel like they haven't said anything. Have I just been missing that in the news? We've had NFL Network on all day, and I, I don't feel like I got a glimmer of what they what's actually wrong with him. No, we haven't gotten any specifics at all. Mm. Just that he's real soul. That makes me super nervous, actually. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on to players that are turning in the right direction. AJ Green finally jumps on this list. John Ross, Jacoby Brissett, Alvin Kamara, James Conner, Luke Wilson, Corey Davis, Kyle Allen, and Matt Ryan. I kind of want to shout out Kyle Allen because he was a late addition to this list. He was listed with a shoulder injury. He didn't lose any reps today in practice, but just something to keep an eye on. AJ Green too, man. Like AJ Green is trending in the right direction physically, but I'm starting to get the feeling that it's a money situation now because he didn't show up apparently to practice at all today. Like, I don't know if he was there during the part of the session that wasn't open to the media, all signs were pointing to him practicing in full today. That's what Zach Taylor said coming out of last week. And now boom, he didn't even show up. Yeah. That's a little concerning. If you have, if you've been holding AJ green to this point in the year and in some leagues where trade deadlines have passed, if you have an early trade deadline and you're still sitting on AJ green, or even if you traded for him, expecting him to come back, that's a real, uh, real shot below the belt. But I understand that uh, Alvin Kamara and Matt Ryan, though, should be good to go Sunday from everything that uh, is being reported. Woo, that's going to be a good game. Yeah, that's there's going to be a lot of points that that to me looks like it's going to be a, a borderline fantasy bonanza. All right. No more on that. That's my what to watch for later. <laughs> well, tell us what <laughs> to do, Murphy. <laughs> for You're sure. not the boss of me. I'm totally the boss of you on this show. All right, let's move on to likely to play. Whoa. (laughs) (laughs) Who's the boss? It's Joe. (laughs) Sorry, Murphy. (laughs) Thank God. No one on this show is named Charles or Jeff would have a bonanza. Oh my God. Could you imagine? But We never found out who the boss was though. Cause that was Charles in charge. That's different. Yeah. Charles, Charles in charge. Boss and Scott. I love that. Wasn't that Tony Danza on that show? Tony Danza was who's the boss. And uh, a little thing about me and my first crush, Alyssa Milano, right there. Boom. That was the daughter in Who's the Boss. I was a kid watching that show. (laughs) Oh, the age gap. Really? I miss Topanga. We really. (laughs) No, that's legit, though. I was part of that generation, too. I really, really enjoy the fact that we could work Tony Danza and Scott Bayo into an episode about fantasy football. And we didn't even once bring up like the 
what was it? The garbage pick and field goal kick in Philadelphia phenomenon. That's over my head. Oh man. That's Go- an old Disney Go- flick. Google right? that one. It's awful. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the guys that are likely to play. David Johnson, Curtis Samuel, Christian McCaffrey, Amari Cooper, TJ Hawkinson, Patrick Mahomes, Alshon Jeffrey, George Kittle, and Kyle Juszczyk. I want to start out with Kyle Juszczyk because I added him on here, not because he's a fantasy relevant player, but because he makes that running game so much better. So it's so good that he's back. If you have a Coleman or a Brita, you've got to be excited about this. Oh, absolutely. And as a 49ers fan, I'm thrilled. The idea that we're getting back used to. No one cares, Jeff. Shut, no one cares if you use You, you shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but no, getting Kittle, use check, and then it looks like Staley and McClinchy are going to be good to go on Monday also. So the offensive line is going to be fully healthy there. You get back use check. You know, if Kittle's good to go, you're talking about a front for the 49ers that's going to be in great shape. Against the Seattle defense, it's starting to kind of reestablish itself as they're getting all their guys back from injury and suspension. So it could be a really good time of the year to get all those guys healthy. So if you've got Coleman and Brita and you need to plug somebody in for a banged up Lev Bell, it seems like a really safe uh, start to me. And you've got a quarterback that's coming off what I think was the best game of his career. So, Oh, yeah. He was pointing in the right direction. Yeah, I think that was the best game of his career last week. He it, played really, really well. Yeah, and that's I think that is Jimmy's ceiling, though. Like, I, I think what we saw oh, yeah, he's Arizona not doing more is, than that. Yeah, that is the absolute peak of, I think, what we'll see. He's not going to be that guy that's going to roll out four touchdowns every week. So if you happen to start him last week, good on you. I wouldn't necessarily try rolling him out any of these upcoming weeks because the schedule gets real tough moving forward. Hey, quickly before we move on, can we talk about David Johnson? What are we doing with David Johnson? Because this is a pretty darn tough matchup. They play Tampa Bay, right? Yes. Yeah, they're really efficient against the run. Really efficient against the run. Are we going to see more David Johnson as a wide receiver with Kenny Drake in the backfield? This is a wait and see situation if you've got the room on your roster, right? Yes, I believe so. Oh man, he's. He, I'm not. I'm not starting him. Like I just I think I have to in my like flex four in one of my deeper leagues. But oh, like yeah. beyond that, that I'm like if you're playing in a standard redraft re- league, you have to try and get him out of your lineup this week. Oh, absolutely. And, and Kenny Drake, you can't start either of them. If you're in a typical redraft, 10 to 12 teams, you know, whatever, with a you know six-man bench, there's a chance that Matt Breida is probably on waivers. Like, that's possible. It's not likely, but it's possible. And if you've got David Johnson, I'm cutting somebody to bring in another back to keep Johnson on the bench until we figure out what Kenyon Drake's going to be moving forward. If David Johnson's moving out to that wide receiver spot with consistency, like that whole offense is, for as many plays as they run in this, you know, all the things they're doing yardage wise, there's not a whole lot of fantasy assets there. Like Kyler's pretty okay. Christian Kirk seems pretty okay when he's healthy, you know, but then everything else is kind of uh, questionable at best. Say James Conner doesn't play this week. Are you playing Jalen Samuels over David Johnson? Yes. What about Kalen Balage? No. I don't, okay. I don't That's kind of where my line is, too. Yeah, I don't trust Kalen Balage at all. I look at him and I see a guy who has all the physical gifts where he should be really good, but there's something missing between the ears and, and in, in, you know, on either side of his nose here. He can't see and he can't think very well when he's got the ball in his hands. So, no thank you. Cheap dates. All right, we've moved into cheap dates. Let's change the format a little bit. Let's just talk about it position by position this time. So, Jeff, your quarterback this week is Ryan Finley. Joe, yours is Philip Rivers, and mine is Jacoby Brissett. Jeff, I want to start with you because Ryan Finley, one might call a ballsy play. Um, ballsy might be an understatement. I mean, this might be the giant coconuts play of the week. I'm only doing this because it's his first start, and he's in a position where we have no film on him, right? We're late in the year, and all the film the Ravens have been watching is with Andy Dalton playing quarterback, and he's not the same kind of guy. Finley plays with good rhythm and good pace. He likes to get rid of the ball as soon as he gets to the top of his drop. We saw a ton of that in the preseason and at NC State. He has a a build kind of like Jared Goff, but he's got more arm strength. Just to kind of give you an example of a comp. If A.J. Green comes back, there's suddenly a full complement of weapons. But uh, I don't know, man. It just seems like a spot where they're going to be trailing. They're going to have to make him throw it he might be worth the $4,800 I'm spending on him. It's an ultimate pay down on quarterback. If I can do it playing Ryan Finley feels like a missing the cash line or winning the Millie kind of play to me. Like, I don't feel like there's a whole lot in between (laughs) on that. 
Oh, I agree. Well, that's why I said it's like the giant coconuts play of the week, because you've got to kind of you're putting your whole lineup on the line by putting him in there. And as we go deeper into this, it actually gets worse. Woo. <laughs> All right, Joseph, Philip Rivers seems pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, let's talk about him more in the Thursday night preview because I have a ton of data on this, but it really fits more in context with all the other players in that game. Gotcha. All right, so my guy, Jacoby Brissett, pretty simple. I mean, he may not have Paris Campbell and T.Y. Hilton, but Paris Hilton. Still plenty of- <laughs> Paris Hilton. He doesn't have Paris Hilton. <laughs> he doesn't have Paris Hilton. It's I not like me. Indianapolis. Think. Yeah. Germ Ursay leeching on her. Just saying. <laughs> But yeah, creeper. again, he has plenty of offensive tools still, and it's Miami. So, I mean, it's just a good matchup. I do reserve the right to switch in Brian Hoyer if Jacoby Brissett is out, if they decide to hold him back just as a precaution. He seems to think he'll play, but a lot could happen between now and then. So, asterisk right there. I think Brissett is an okay pay down option, but at 6000 I think if I was playing a not cheap dates lineup, I'm paying a few hundred dollars more for a better option. No, oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's without saying. Yeah. And, and I like Brissett. I think he's actually played really well. He's acquitted himself pretty well. The Colts are that that line when he's playing where it's like, this is what a playoff team looks and feels like. And if you beat them, you're probably a playoff team. And if you don't beat them, you're probably not a playoff team. So I think he's done a very nice job considering all the, the Andrew Luck related circumstances. All right, let's move on to running backs. Jeff, you have Joe Mixon. Joe, you have Devin Singletary, and I have Damian Williams. Joe, let's start with you this time. Devin Singletary, I know you and Jeff fought over this one, actually, to start out. I think Devin Singletary is the best paydown option at any position this week. 20 carries last week. He's played 66 or more percent of the snaps in each of the last two weeks. Frank Gore has been totally ineffective. On the other hand, Devin Singletary has been not ineffective. He's been awesome. So I think we're looking at a breakout that the pricing hasn't caught up to yet. I think he's in a smash spot. I think he's in a place where he's going to get 15 to 20 carries, four to six targets. He could be the best play of the week. Oh, I agree with that. I mean, I wanted Singletary pretty badly. And, uh, you know, it's funny is when we were all filming these out individually, I thought I was the first one to fill my lineup out. So I'm like, ha, 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 I got Singletary. And then I found out Joe beat me by like a day and a half. And, uh, that, <laughs> I kind of, the early bird gets the one. I know, man. man. I kind of wanted to cry a little bit. I was like, no, I had to reform the entire lineup. It was terrible. All right. So Jeff, Joe Mixon, you have faith? No. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a dart throw. It's, so here's the deal. I mean, when you're trying to find a running back to pay down for, and you're trying to get under that $5,000 category because you need to pay up somewhere else, I'm willing to bet on some talent. Right. That's always something I'm just willing to side with. And if I've got a guy as talented as Joe Mixon, you know, circumstances be damned, you know, 4,700, I've got to take it as a dart throw. Now, we talked about Finley being the kind of the big coconuts play of the week. Well, they could try to alleviate the pressure on him by actually running it quite a bit with Mixon and dumping it off to him, running play action, try to find ways to buy the the youngster some time. And, uh, you know, Here's the thing at 4,700. He doesn't have to do a whole lot to return value and it allows me to pay up in a few other spots. Yeah, man, that's a scary play, but I like Joe Mixon as a player. I just traded for him in the sleeper wire pro am. I don't have a whole lot of faith that he's going to get it together, but he's going to be a super low owned play this week. So if you're going contrarian, Mixon is a guy that you could do worse than. Yeah, there's just not that many great options at that $5,000 marker. I mean, Singletary is the guy. And uh, that's the one where, I mean, you know, not to take anything away from Murphy, he's about to talk about his guy, but it's it's pretty slim once you get under five grand at running back this week. Well, all right, then I'll go into my guy. It's Damian Williams again. But after last week, he had that crazy run. He's getting usage. He's looking like the Damian Williams they'd hoped. There will still be a timeshare. LaShawn McCoy will still get carries, but Pat Mahomes is back. They have to respect the passing game. I feel like Damian Williams could bust out for 15, 20 points this week. It just feels like a solid matchup. So I'm going Damian Williams at 4,900 and feeling pretty confident about it. So, I mean, Damian's got the Titans this week and that defense is actually pretty talented. A pretty underrated group. I mean, getting Jeffrey Simmons back, the rookie, he looks good and putting him next to Jarrell Casey and then some of the speed they have on the back half. And Logan Ryan's quietly one of the best fantasy defensive backs out there. They've been really, really solid. So, you know, hopefully it works out for you. But man, that defense is no joke. That's a good point, Jeff. 
But the counterpoint here is Damian Williams played 71.7% of the snaps last week. I don't know what he did to get in the doghouse or like LaShawn McCoy maybe got into the doghouse, losing them that game with the fumble, but holy cow, like 71.7 is Kareem Hunt last year kind of stuff. To be clear, I was pretty high on Damian Williams in the offseason. I liked him a lot. If I'm just looking at one matchup in a vacuum and I'm looking at the Titans defense versus a still kind of hit and miss chief. So line, even though they do have to respect the pass game, I wonder what his role is really going to be in terms of just number of touches and yardage volume and all that. I do love him. I think he's a much more athletic guy than anybody else they have on the roster in terms of the running back position. And he should be getting all of those touches because the kid's fantastic. But I don't know if I trust Andy Reid to really give him the right carries and get him targeted at the right times to maximize fantasy value. Why well, he's not more than 5,000. Exactly. All right, let's move into wide receivers. Jeff, you have Ola BC Johnson, Joe, Jamison Crowder, and myself, Devonte Parker. Joe, I actually want to say that uh, I agree with you so much on Jamison Crowder. I paid down and he's in my other wide receiver slot. I think he's a great play, man. I think that they haven't caught up to Sam Darnold being back yet because Sam Darnold is absolutely glued to Jamison Crowder. Target after target after target. Oh, yeah. This is definitely one of those like Wes Welker level situations where he's just criminally underrated in a situation where he's got the right chemistry of the quarterback and he doesn't make a ton of like deep catches and he's not going to catch a ton of touchdowns. But man, he's just going to get peppered with targets and he'll go ahead and get you 10 and 95 and suddenly you've got a pretty good day out of Crowder with no touchdowns. And if he scores one, he's absolutely smashed for you. Like uh, last week, he was one of the best plays on the slate. Yeah. I mean, I didn't run him this week, but that is a phenomenal play and I love it quite a bit. All right, Jeff. So explain Ola BC Johnson to me. Thielen's gone. That's it. No Adam Thielen. Steph Diggs just evaporated last week. Somebody's got to get the ball. Kirky's going to throw it around. I mean, I know they're going to give it to Dalvin Cook and Madison and those guys, but BC Johnson just kind of quietly gets some work done, whether it's on the outside or over the middle. Just a solid guy at 3,800. Heck, paying down there, it allowed me to really pay up my flex spot and uh, paid up a few extra dollars at uh, my other wide receiver and other running back slots. He's a punt player with upside, basically. I think he's a little better than a punt. I mean, he's 3,800. Yeah, that indicates kind of a punt play, but the thing of it is, is the role is there. He's getting targets. And Thielen's gone. So even if sure, he, but that was the case two weeks ago as well. And he had 5.8 points. So it's not like sure. he's like guaranteed production. Well, in that, that particular week, Diggs went absolutely ham sticks and he caught what seven or eight balls for like 140 yards. He went absolutely insane. So, I mean, that's not going to happen every week either. So I, I don't know. I, for me, I'm like, Hey, if we're trying to stay under a certain dollar value, right? I'm just looking at roll and I see a position where the Vikings are probably gonna have to put it up quite a bit. I'll, I'll be willing to throw down on some BC Johnson. Yeah. The thing about all BC Johnson is like, if you look at his week six snap share, it was 28%. It's consistently risen and it was 83% last week. So he's a guy that's out there. He's running routes. He should get plenty of volume. It's just, if he gets in the end zone, he's absolutely crushing for you at that price. Well, absolutely. And like I say, he doesn't have to do much, right? That's always the thing with our cheap dates is who's a guy that can give us just a little bit of something, just enough to return value. Mine feels pretty self-explanatory. You know, no Preston Williams. Fitzmagic's got to toss the ball around. Devontae Parker has been doing pretty well recently. I feel pretty good about him at 4,800. So cheap to wide receiver. Because I couldn't do Jameson Crowder, obviously. But you did too. <laughs> I mean, I did too, but not as my cheap date. You know, I actually, that's your credit. I kind of had two cheap dates too. I stacked Mike Williams with Phillip rivers. I don't know where you can find a guy that's getting seven and a half targets a game over the last six weeks for $4,500. That does that pricing doesn't make sense to me at all. He's got huge upside at that price. Oh yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a real big fan of like, you know, hey, Mike Williams at 4,500. And if you're going to look at Parker at that 4,800 marker, I mean, both are reasonable plays. All right, let's move into tight ends. Jeff, you have Tyler Eifert. Joe, you have Irv Smith. And I picked Cameron Brait this week. Joe, I'm going to start with you. Irv Smith, I'm excited. Do you remember what Jeff said about Ola B.C. Johnson? Dart throw. Yeah, just, upside. just pretend that I said that again. Adam Thielen's out. <laughs> the, the one thing that was really cool about what's been happening with Irv Smith is he was getting like two slot snaps a week and then three slot snaps a week. It was up to 13 last week. So... 
you don't really block from the slot all that often. Like you're running routes out of the slot most of the time. So he's a guy that has some upside. If he catches a touchdown, he absolutely destroys for you at this price. Yeah, I actually love that. And I love Irv Smith as a prospect. People were kind of wondering about him when everybody was talking about Noah Fant and they were talking about Hawkinson and all that. And I think Irv Smith has the ability to be that big slot, you know, move tight end. He can do a lot just like those other guys can. And to me, he might even be a little bit more refined as a route runner. Like he just looks good out there running around. They had him running a couple different like out routes and comebacks and some things uh, two weeks ago when Thielen was out. And he looked really good. He looked natural as a receiver. And that's a huge boom for a guy you've got moving into the slot that often. And he's tied with Zach Ertz in yards per route run over the last three weeks. Like he's not just a uh, like pitch it out to the screen and he, he's running routes. He's getting downfield. He, I think he's a good play. I, this isn't just a cheap dates play for me. This is a play I'm going to be making in other lineups as well. Yeah. I love that quite a bit. That's a, that's a great spot there. All right, Jeff Tyler Eifert rounds out your Bengals stack. So uh, uh, that sounds uh, awful. Man. I just want to vomit when you say here's it. the thing. This lineup with my Bengals stack kind of makes me want to drink an entire bottle of Pepto. It's pretty bad um, because that's how awful I feel about it right now. But Eifert, so I'm going back to Finley. Hey, man, it's a rookie quarterback. And these kind of guys, what do they love? They love their tight ends. It's a security blanket. (coughs) It's somebody he can lean on. He's a veteran player who's going to find open spots and zones and he can move around and get open. He's healthy enough, I guess. He's not he hasn't been, uh, you know, banged up that we know of in the last couple of weeks. So, heck, another dart throw. Give me those Bengals. Give me all the Bengals. I think maybe we should talk about things you shouldn't do in DFS and take this opportunity because the (laughs) Bengals have a 17.25 implied total in this game. Like you need a touchdown out of each of these guys and they're barely projected to score that many. (laughs) I'm actually looking for a few catches out of Eifert. And again, all the Bengals guys are so cheap. It doesn't take much. I got $3,000 on Eifert. I don't need a whole lot. If he happens to get a touchdown, I'm I'm winning. I'm winning with Eifert there because if he gets a touchdown, then Finley obviously got me a touchdown. But I think that they're going to be trailing. There's going to be some garbage time yardage. There's going to be some garbage time catches. It's just a situation where I don't expect them to go out and put up 28. And the stack happened by accident. I didn't sit here and be like, you know what I'm going to do? Stack the Bengals. Like that didn't really cross my mind. I was just and looking it at the, shouldn't. That yeah, should never ever, cross your mind ever. for a team with a 17.25 implied total. That's why I seriously just want to grab a bottle of the pink stuff and just <laughs> chug it down because that's how bad I feel about this. It's awful. But being able to put that stack together, let me pay up in other spots. All right. I'll round out the tight ends here. Cameron Bray, it's it's all about the matchup. I mean, Jameis Winston's going to throw the ball and the Cardinals are awful against the tight end. So $3,700 felt like a value. I'm not worried about this. I actually stacked Mike Evans in my lineup as well. I, I believe a lot in what they're going to do this week. Do you know what this means, Murphy, that you put both of those guys in your lineup? What does it mean? It's OJ Howard season. You know, I wouldn't be upset at that. I'd be upset <laughs> for the cheat dates, but as a, as a fan, I wouldn't be upset. You know, what's funny is he would, he's not at the doghouse. Though. I mean, we have between us, we've taken Godwin Evans and Brait. And and I know we're going to talk more about the other guys we paid up for, but between the three of us, those are players we've all taken now. And no one decided to go with Winston as a quarterback or even thought about him. Is he alive for this? I think he's priced too high. Oh, is he? Yeah, I think he's priced too high. I mean, he shouldn't be, but. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, interceptions only lose you a point on DraftKings. So like there's upside Uh, no matter what for Jameis Winston. That's fair. All right. So moving on to defenses, Jeff, you have the Giants. Joe, you are against me with the Cardinals, and I took the Chiefs. Joe, I'm going to start with you. What you got against my players, man? Play Playing the defense against me? Tampa Bay hasn't had an opposing DST score less than four points yet this year. Tampa Bay has allowed 30 sacks, six fumble recoveries, and 12 interceptions. Look at what they did against the Rams. 10 points for the Rams defense. They put up 55 on them. <laughs> Mm. Like, I don't like the Cardinals defense. I think this is going to be a high scoring game, but I still think there's upside for their DST. I think the Cardinals are actually a little underrated defensively right now. Getting back Patrick Peterson matters. And so that's going to create more interesting matchups. They haven't had him really all year. And, you know, I know that getting back on the field, he was a little rough when he first got back on, but 
he's still an elite corner and he should be feared on, on his side of the field. So you never know that that could be uh, a deterrent to throwing to that side. And maybe it creates some unique opportunities to get some turnovers. All right, Jeff, I get your giants pick. We talked earlier in the show already about how the Jets offense is pretty bad outside of players like Crowder who have good fantasy value, but yeah, it feels like a pretty good pick for you. The giants are going to have a pretty decent day. I mean, we all paid down here, right? I mean, for 2,800, I feel like I'm in a position going against the Jets that Leb Bell's potentially hurt. If he doesn't play Bilal Powell's the running back, perhaps he's kind of terrible. Sam Darnold hasn't been who we thought he was going to be a few weeks back. And if he's just getting garbage time throws underneath to, uh, to Crowder and doesn't put up a touchdown, it's possible this D line and secondary ends up making a, you know, a few interceptions, maybe a few sacks. There's going to be some turnovers. There's going to be some ugliness to this ball game. So I'm willing to take one of the defenses. Give me the Giants all day. All right. So I chose the Chiefs partially on what Joe talked about in the last show about how the secondary might be something to be respected now. And they're playing the Titans. So you're talking about Ryan Tannehill. I'm not really worried about that. Derek Henry may have a pretty solid day, but I think the Chiefs will hold their own. They'll get a few sacks. I think they'll have a solid fantasy day. I think they're a pretty safe play. I went with safe on this one. And I feel like they are. There's a really nice DFS strategy that you've employed here. And I don't really know if you knew that you were doing it, but playing a team's running back and DST together, it has a nice correlation because if the team goes up big because their defense is playing well, their running back is going to be good. So I like the move. Yeah, I actually like picking up the Chiefs here, too. It's uh, I think they're coalescing a little bit and then getting Mahomes back on the field is going to keep them fresh. It's going to be a, a good play, I think. All right, so that's our cheap dates. Let's start with you, Joe. Is anybody else on your lineup you want to shout out? So maybe that maybe one of the higher price players you picked. The reason that I went so cheap, I paid down at all of my wide receiver spots. I've got Jamison Crowder, Zach Pascal, Mike Williams in my three wide receiver spots. I did that so I could play Christian McCaffrey and Dalvin Cook. I think they're both in smash spots. And like Dalvin Cook... He was having, he had a rough week last week because he didn't score any touchdowns, but he had his highest snap count of the entire season. So I think he's moving in the right direction. And I think after last week, some people are going to be off him that were on him last week. I think it's a good spot to play Dalvin Cook. I mean, I love Dalvin Cook. I just, you know, once players start getting to like, you know, 92, 93, you know, 9,400 bucks on DK, I typically just kind of walk away. Man, McCaffrey at 10,000. Holy shnikes. Like he's got to get, you know, 30 plus now. Granted, he's done that a few times, Joe, right? He's done that almost every time this yeah. year. <laughs> Golly. Like, it just kills me that he's going to, that it's probably a better than 60% chance that he returns value on 10, five. And it just blows me away. All right, Jeff, we're moving on to you. Is there anybody else you want to shout out from your lineup? I mean, this Bengal stack makes this whole lineup feel pretty dirty already, but, uh, you know, it actually gets even worse than that on my pay ups, if you ask me. So I went and grabbed Marlon Mack. He doesn't catch any balls in the passing game and he doesn't score touchdowns. So why would I go with him? Well, they're playing the Dolphins. The Colts O line versus the Dolphins D line. I'm just expecting him to roll right over them. And even if he doesn't get a ton of snaps, it's totally plausible that he goes 100 yards and a touchdown. He's seven grand. It's a lot. I need him to do some work. I need, you know, 21 out of him to feel good about it. I think it's feasible just on the ground here. I grabbed Chris Godwin as a pay up because, well, in Godwin, we trust. I grabbed Manuel Sanders just because I can't seem to get him anywhere else. So I only take him in DK 6,800 for him, man. Jimmy G loves him and it's going to be Emmanuel Sanders and George Kittle as the two guys he just looks for in every play. So hard not to love him at 6,800. And I grabbed Saquon as my big pay up. That's my, my big prize. My hope is that the Giants D shuts down the Jets and the Giants have to salt this game away with Saquon late and he just runs over through them and around them. All right. And for me, I kind of want to shout out Josh Jacobs for $5,700. He's been pretty productive recently. He's really showing off that he's worth the first round pick they used on him. So I felt pretty confident throwing him in there. I paid up for players like Michael Thomas because I think that's going to be a shootout and Mike Evans. So basically, Jeff, you and I flip the coin and we'll see who wins. Is it a Godwin or Evans week? (laughs) Basically this point we're just saying you know our wins will come on that why not both it's possible the arizona defense is not that impressive so yeah it's very possible it's definitely possible and as much as i you know do think pat peterson is someone to be feared he's probably going to end up shadowed over evans because peterson doesn't move into the slot so if godwin moves inside 
that's where a lot of looks and, and passes are going to get funneled. That's why I went Godwin. Thursday night preview Raiders versus Chargers. Chargers. All right. As the drop said, Raiders versus Chargers. Normally we start out with injuries, but there are no major injuries, at least fantasy relevant ones. So we can just dive into the player matchups. Let's start with quarterbacks. You've got Derek Carr. You got Phillip Rivers. Neither defense has been overly impressive. I mean, last week, the Chargers had a pretty good weekend against the Packers. And you got to wonder a little bit if that's the Packers offense or the Chargers defense. I really think there's potential for this to be a shootout as well. But it's Thursday night, so it could easily be a 10-10 game start of the fourth quarter. It is the third highest over-under on the whole week slate. So I I think it's going to be a pretty high-scoring game. Looks like a shootout on paper, too. The Chargers are a one-point road favorite, which seems pretty surprising to me. But all of their games feel like road games. I mean, they are all road games. (laughs) (laughs) Terrible. They're used to it. It's not anything new for them. Heck, it's probably better accommodations in Oakland than what they have in L.A. (laughs) <laughs> totally look I'm not excited about Derek Carr here though I like I'm not optimistic the Chargers have allowed only one 30 plus point performance 220 plus point performance six of their games they've allowed fewer than 20 points and five of those it was fewer than 15 and on the flip side Carr's only scored 20 plus once and that was against Houston I'm just not I don't see the upside here if you're in an emergency stream situation you could play Carr but I'm steering clear yeah, I, I don't blame you. I'm not really big on the, the Derek Carr thing right now, especially considering his wide receiving group is leaving a lot to be desired. I really like Hunter Renfro and where he's headed. But Tyrell Williams, you know, if you want to go with the revenge narrative or whatever, you know, Zay Jones, we don't really know what we're what we have with him and probably won't for a few more weeks yet. So I just I don't love it. I, I think he's going to get beat up pretty badly by uh, by the bigger Bosa. Hey, man, you know that Nathan Peterman man? He's going to be my starter next year. <laughs> <laughs> I do a terrible John Gruden, but I feel like that might be a thing. He looked like my pep talk worked. We need, we need <laughs> to get some Frank Kelly endo on here. Stat. He might be a little bit above our uh, pay grade Pro- here. Probably. <laughs> I haven't seen him on anything in a while. Let's talk about Philip Rivers real quick because he's in an absolute smash spot. The Raiders have only given up fewer than 27 points to a quarterback since week three one time. Chase Daniel, 19.8 points in week five. The Raiders are also the fourth worst pass defense by football outsiders DVOA. I'm Rivers isn't just my cheap date this week. I'm playing him in my cash lineup. Yeah, I'm hoping Frit Rivers falls on his face, but I don't think he will. Uh, I'm going against him in like four leagues. So I really need him to actually just like pack it in at the end of the first quarter and decide he doesn't want to play anymore. But he's probably not. And this is going to be a situation where he's probably going 325 and three and I'm going to be crying into my beer all weekend to get right game for those receivers. Yep. All right. Moving on to running backs for the Raiders. You got Josh Jacobs. And what did you write here? Joe, Andre Richardington, Jay Andre Richard. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) I mean, you're right. They are kind of coupled Jalen Richard, Deandre Washington. Uh, uh, I was reading that and I was like, who's this guy? I never heard of that guy before. (laughs) Took me a second. (laughs) Joe's digging deep. (laughs) It's a Harris football podcast reference. It's funny. Gotcha. All right. Well, we've already talked about Josh Jacobs and my cheap dates. You know, he's, he's in a pretty good spot. I think he's gonna have a good game. What do you guys think? Play all the running backs in this game. Oh yeah. Just period. Oh yeah. Yeah. Line them up. Even Austin Eckler. You're fine playing Austin Eckler. Yep. I concur. I'm playing one guy who's got rivers, Gordon and Eckler going against me this week. Not feeling great about that. No, you shouldn't be. All right, then wide receivers. You got Tyro Williams, Hunter Renfro, and Zay Jones for the Raiders. Keenan Allen and shout out to the Roto Bros. Big Mike Williams, BMW for uh, for the Chargers. I don't think I'm really excited to play any of those Oakland wide receivers. Tyro Williams, the narrative is fun, but he seems like he's still kind of banged up. Yeah, man, I really, I want him to be something more than he is, but they brought him in to be a two because they thought they were going to have Antonio Brown this year. And being forced into the number one role really isn't for him. I don't think that's a good fit, but Hunter Renfro is the guy out of the three that I'd probably want if I'm being asked to play one of them. But man, the Chargers wideouts, I'm starting Mike Williams in one league and I've got Keenan Allen and two or three others. So yeah, they're, they're pretty safe goes this week for DFS, man. The Mike Williams, Phillip Rivers stack doesn't get much better. Like it's a total of $10,000 for the two players. You're going to crush at that point. I hope you're wrong. I'm actually praying you're wrong. 
<laughs> I don't. Think I don't I think am. you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and for tight ends, we've got Darren Waller and Hunter Henry. What do you guys think? You want to play any of the tight ends in this game? Hunter Henry, you always play. I think if Hunter Henry's healthy, he's a smash play all the time. And Oakland has allowed 10 plus points to five tight ends this year. So he's a guy that I'm definitely throwing out there. Waller is a guy you have to play as well, probably, unless you're one of those. I have Austin Hooper and Darren Waller guys, but I'm moderately afraid about the matchup. The Chargers haven't allowed more than 10 points to any single tight end outside of Jordan Aikens and Darren Fells in week three in that really weird outlier game all season. So Jimmy Graham, Johnny Smith, Vance McDonald, TJ Hawkinson, Jack Doyle, Eric Ebron. Like these aren't huge names, but none of these guys produced anything against this defense. Yeah, I think Waller is the most talented guy out of that group, though. Absolutely. I'm expecting decent things from him, but... You know, he's one of those guys that's been putting up like 30 points on occasion, and I don't think that's this week. Yeah, I mean, I think we're looking for 15 to 18 is a, is a high ceiling, and we feel really, really good about that. All right, guys, who do you think wins? Chargers? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the Bolts. I think it's going to be a pretty close game, though. I think, barring one of those weird Thursday night flukes, this should be a pretty good matchup. These teams are both kind of bad. And they're kind of bad in the same ways. Right. And that's, yeah, that's definitely something worth, uh, you know, keeping an eye on too, because something we'll talk about what to watch for is how these two teams are fighting for their playoff lives right now. This is effectively a playoff game. So it'll be interesting to see how they come out and show up. What to watch for in the early slate on Sunday, I'm going to be watching the bills hit the road to face off against the disappointing Cleveland Browns. Vegas is pretty smart. But Cleveland minus 2.5 seems like about as sure a thing as we've seen this year. I'm not saying you should bet your house on the bills, but maybe you should bet your house on the bills. You know, probably not, but maybe. My first one to watch for is Raiders versus Chargers. We've already talked about this game a little bit, but it's weed out season. The loser of this game is basically eliminated from playoff contention. Thursday night games, kind of like London games, they always seem to give a mixed bag of results. So I'm not looking for a ton of fantasy output, except for maybe for the Chargers. But I am looking to see which of these two teams is going to put up a fight for that wild card spot. One, two, three. Here's a good one for you. The Saints-Falcons game in the early slate on Sunday. I mean, what's not to love about a divisional matchup full of fantasy talent? With Matt Ryan back, will the Falcons make it a shootout? My gut says yes. Start all your studs in this game. Anyone who listens regularly knows I'm always watching the 49ers and have been downplaying them and their undefeated record. This primetime matchup against the Seahawks is their greatest test yet and kicks off a run of games which they'll see Russell Wilson twice, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, and Lamar Jackson. A win here will be a big one in their quest for home field advantage. All right, my second one to watch for is the Panthers-Packers on Sunday. I know you understand wanting to watch any game with CMC in it, but actually, I'll be more focused on Aaron Rodgers. He's got to be hot under the collar after his offense got stuck in neutral for three quarters last week. And that in the past has led to some fun fantasy days. Will the cheese triplets get back on track? Sure hope so. Vikings at Cowboys on Sunday night football could have major postseason implications as the playoff picture comes into focus. The Vikings are hot on the tail of the Packers and Dallas could use a cushion on an Eagles team who closes out with four of five games against teams battling for top five picks in 2020 with both teams live implied totals sitting in the mid twenties. This one has shootout potential written all over it Sunday and Monday night football this week should be a couple of the best nationally televised matchups. We'll see all year. Soak it in takeaway nation. These ones don't come along often. All right, that does it for our Week 10 preview show. Kept the dead jokes to a minimum. I'm proud of you, Jeff. Only like one or two. I mean, you know, we were trying to go fast tonight. <laughs> fast and loose. All right, guys, we'll be back on Tuesday to talk about all the Week 10 stuff, see what we were right on, see what we were wrong on, and see if that Bengal stack did anything for Jeff. Spoiler alert, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> For Joe at Human Stat Sheet on Twitter, for Jeff at NFL underscore DiMatteo, and of course myself at Murphy MFT, or find us all in the NFL Fantasy Football Discussion Group. We'll see you next week. Don't start the Bengals. Bye, guys. Later. Who day? Gross. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs>
for listening to the Fantasy Takeaway Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And follow the show on Twitter at FF Takeaway. Who day is the Bengals, right? Yeah. It's like who dat's like, okay, that's the Saints. Okay. I always get the who day and the who dat backwards.